Yeah. Okay. Well, draft is done. We have uh, our assumptions of what's going to happen. Let's see how it actually breaks down as we head into game two of Bet Boom versus Liquid and see whether or not Bet Boom can finally get a series win over Liquid. If Liquid's finally going to lose a series here at ESL One Birmingham, and who's going to end up going into uh, a playoff upper bracket position between these two teams? As of course, need to be able to start off with a quick buzz. Also, a pretty important game for Liquid in terms of <laughs> like you don't want to pick this flesh and then lose the Lesh and have it get exposed. And then second game, Just not re-pick the Lesh, which means you have shown you, you know, not necessarily you lose confidence in it, but the, the, the idea of countering it is viable. Pick a Doom, your other like big strat. And then if you lose with the Doom, then like, where does that leave you, right? It leaves you in a position where teams are going to look at you and be like, all right, we can give them the Lesh and beat it. We can give them the Doom and beat it. And maybe that opens up some bands and then suddenly you don't feel so good about this first phase. These types of games are, are really important on the long run of a tournament of like, is your hero that you want to first pick scary? And are you making it scary against all the other teams? Because if Boom win here, then you lose some threat on two heroes that were really big threats for you in this tournament so far. Yeah. Investigating network. Oh my God. It's goddamn uh -oh. flax chewing on the lines again, man. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that, <laughs> that man gets more and more feral as tournaments go on. You know, I, I just swear to God, like at some point in time, Slacks made it and he just became like a guaranteed invite. And he took that security and just ran with it <laughs> and has become more insane. And, like he becomes more insane faster, you know? You know what I mean? Like the tournament starts off and he's already like, <laughs> like, like what did he did the fucking he did the jump scare to XM in that one interview? Uh, was it XM or XXS or uh, somebody? It was one of the Chinese players and he was just like, yeah, it was XXS. That's right. And it was <laughs> like the jump scare out of nowhere. Dude, I was mad for him. I like <laughs> normally I love Slacks' content, but I hate when people jump scare. You know, it's just a, it's just obnoxious. This, this, this group stage interviews that this guy's already, ah! <laughs> you know, I'm just, what the, calm down, man. Jesus. I have a full feeling that after that interview, XXS just walked like to his manager and he's like, I want that man off the premises. Please, please remove him from the tournament. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who that was, but I don't want him here anymore. You know, <laughs> I don't want to have to drive 30 minutes and then get jump scared by the interviewer, please. <laughs> ESL. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm sitting here falling asleep in the 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 30 minute car ride over, and then I'm getting jump scared by the interview. View. It's so much worse because you know, like the reason it stood out was one of the Chinese players, right? So he may not be understanding what Slacks is saying when Slacks. So it comes as a complete surprise when all of a sudden he just screams he, he out of nowhere. Him. He got him for sure, but I, I respect that, you know. <laughs> You gotta make these players open up, get excited a little bit more. Esports interviews are pretty hit or miss. No, you gotta man, you gotta jostle the feathers every now and then, keep people on their that's, toes. That's why Slacks is uh, is the goat when it comes to to this sort of thing. He is uh, he is the absolute best, and I think the community does not understand how good Slacks is at being able to get uh, personality out of uh, out of esports players. All right. Well, you don't have to. You don't have to sell them on it. You know. Oh, you were selling me. I, was like, well, well, I think Slack's segment. pretty good at his job. I said he was chewing like on asshole. the lines. I said he was chewing on the lines. Uh -huh. well, that's where this started. You know. And uh, yeah, exactly. And I follow. I follow you. You're, you're saying there's something negative about Slack's. I follow that up with something that I thought of, and then you you sell me out. I followed you I into this, you and, and then you're job. just like, well, I think Slack's is pretty good at his job. <laughs> Isn't he? Yes, he is. He's, he's the best, actually. And I think you're pretty good at your job, too. Nah, I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's on you then, brother. I don't know what to tell you, you know? <laughs> if that was the case, we wouldn't be on, on this remote group stage game, would we? I mean, belief, belief's the hell of a drug, you know? You either have it or you don't. Mm, Sometimes true. it presents itself in mysterious ways. It's the game All of right. Dota 2. This is a high matchup. Belief. 
Uh, this is to determine uh, who is going to be ending up in the upper bracket. Uh, Bet Boom have, have already secured themselves. It's either upper bracket or tiebreaker for upper bracket for playoffs. Liquid still need to be able to uh, to uh, do the same by equaling out this series. But uh, talking about the, the tournament as a whole, uh, because I believe we get a chance to be able to talk about uh, Group B, for example, which we've only been casting Group A games. So we get a chance to uh, to actually cast one of those. Uh, what do you think about what's going on in uh, the Group B right now? Because that is where the biggest upsets are happening, right? Heroic OG. OG wasn't even supposed to be at this tournament. I don't think many people had Heroic as top two in that group. Uh, yeah. Potentially extreme and game and gladiators being eliminated. Basically, you're guaranteed to either have Team Spirit, Extreme, Game and Gladiators, two of three of those teams are being eliminated. I don't think anybody had those guys being eliminated. Well, maybe Gaming Gladiators, but Extreme just won a tournament. Team Spirit is two-time TI winners, you know, like Gaming Gladiators, multi-major winners. Like all three of these teams have like significant accolades. So you would expect them to do well in this group, but th this group has just been uh, flipped on its head, man. Just the upsets. I mean, maybe it's the... You know, this patch is in a, in a weird you, place. Avery. Great, great oh, that's analysis. What it is. Just well, let me give you the analysis. I was about to give it and, until you, you stopped my point. I'm saying we're at the point in a patch where you had a meta develop and then it kind of got like overdeveloped because Falcons mm. won. Like they did so well at so many turns in a row that the meta kind of developed around these first phase picks they were exploiting. The Razor, the Pango, the DK, right? The Timber, like yeah. the Doom. And then after that is a question of, well, if that's if that's the meta and we don't have a balance patch and that's just how it is, like, what can you do to disturb that? And I think these teams that come in like Heroic, like OG, that weren't stuck in that of trying to figure out Razor and DK for three tournaments in a row, have some fresh ideas, have some some new ways of playing, like the hero matchups, the core matchups, the itemization, they come in and they, they can upset that Whoa. status quo a bit yes. more oh. than the teams who've been yes. trying to, like, make their own version of it work, right? If you come in and you're just trying to play Razor better than a Falcons, or you're trying to play a DK better than a Liquid, or, you know, a Faceless Void better than XG, those teams can just stay at the top. But if you come in and, like, Heroic, you're playing Slarks and random other, like, garbage that no one has played for, like, two months, it just takes people off guard, and I think that's what can create those upsets. To give you the analysis, Austin, that's what can create those upsets in the first place. Uh, I think that's one of the big reasons we're seeing it. Also, maybe just people underestimating those teams a little bit, including yeah. myself and OG, especially like OG is the ultimate team of you. You cut off one of their limbs and they're going to win the race like this team just thrives when you put them in an unadvantageous position. Oh, you're at a, tourn a tournament we didn't even qualify for. Guess what? Now we're going to do well. You know, I bet if they mm -hmm. had qualified for this tournament, they'd be like a last place in the group. But because like they didn't. They're some underdog now, and this team just every time they're an underdog, they they win a land or something. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that team just go top three, purely based off the fact that they weren't even supposed to be here. That makes sense to me. In, in the world of OG and Dota, that is how it's generally worked out. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna ask this right now, Avery. Do you do you want to you want to keep uh, filling for a bit? You want to keep talking about uh, some some Dota? You want to you want to go to a break? Because it looks like well, they, this they, this is gonna be a bit. They told me we had to go to break. Okay, well then we're. Oh, we don't have. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have to. <laughs> we don't have. No, we can... me I don't have to. Okay, yeah, yeah, let's talk then. I always prefer to talk. What do you want to talk about, Austin? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, our, our producer is talking to us right now. You guys can't hear, but uh, she, she just said, "Do a podcast." Well, funnily enough, <laughs> we actually do a podcast. So you know, yeah. we, uh, Austin, <laughs> Austin does six of them right now. One for every day of the week. No, no, and, no, no, not. But not on Sunday. <laughs> Cap takes the Sabbath off. He's a very religious man, and they make sure he respects the Sabbath. Doesn't have a podcast on Sunday. So if you're if you're a religious viewer, tune into his other six podcasts because you'll really enjoy them. Listen, but to be specific, <laughs> I have four of them. I don't oh, have sorry. six My because bad. that would be that would be the six Infinity Gems, and I am Thanos, uh, and I will have uh, claimed the I Infinity was, Gauntlet. You know, I thought it was five. It's six now. No, it's there's the there's one in the. The, oh, that one doesn't know, count, dude. That's in back of the hand. Like I don't what, know. That's <laughs> what do you mean that doesn't count? There's six infinity <laughs> stones. Whatever, man. 
No, I mean, he, yeah, but he like always had one of them, right? Isn't that the lore? I don't know the lore. I don't know Marvel lore, honestly. Like, that, that lore is just, it's it's not good. It's not good. It's not like Dota lore. <laughs> it's, not, it's bad lore. Not like Dota yeah. lore, of Yeah, course. exactly. Dota With lore. Crownfall. You know, Dota lore is just, it's, it's great, dude. Dota lore is great. Like, you have people like Sniper. His lore is just he's a dude with a gun. Like, that's great. You know, that is well thought out. Deep lore. You can base an entire event on that. He's just what a guy who's really good with a gun. That's yeah. <laughs> in, I think we need more of those world. guys in, Do in Dota too. We need another yeah. gun character. That's what Dota's missing. Uh, <laughs> we just we just need shotgun hero. You know, like we have. I guess we had Morphling for a while, who literally has the shotgun taunt. That's actually crazy now that I think about it. That that's in the game. That his taunt is he just turns into a shotgun. <laughs> Nobody's ever like commented on this once. You know, that's true. The most Kona thing I've ever seen. But it's also interesting that Ice Frog or Valve or whoever, they incorporate a lot of memes. If you, th if you thought about the memes over the history of Dota, yeah. they actually put a decent amount of them in the game. Like that, for example, like the shotgun Morphling, oh, now it's a taunt, you know? Uh, the mm -hmm. Tidehunter Watermelon, now it's a taunt. Yeah. I feel like that's just how they make a taunt. They look at the meme for the hero and then they make it a taunt. So I don't know, maybe Techies should get a taunt that's just like, we all suffer together and he has a goth arcana. As he made everybody miserable for ten years. I mean, maybe I mean, they'll uh, maybe they'll uh, give uh, Shinku and uh, Slacks probably the only two people who wish this, and they'll revert to uh, old techies. They'll revert to old techies, and then they'll come out with the the, the 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 emo emo techies arcana. That, that hero was an abomination. I'm glad it's gone. It's never going to come back. I'm glad it's never going to come back. At least I hope it's never going to come back. You know, I think that's the way it should be. You have you have your times in life where you can enjoy making other people miserable. And I think I think people like Wait, no. Flax wait, wait, no, that. hold up, hold up. I'm not <laughs> they just had that let for a while. Sneak that in. <laughs> and now it's you gone. You don't get to just have a time where you make other people miserable. <laughs> what are you talking that's, about? That's not it's not something that every person has. First of all, nor should you have that. <laughs> Second of all, what? Okay, I'm gonna be honest. That's something I just said and didn't really think about before I said it. But on, now that I'm thinking about it, and I have to defend it because I said it. <laughs> that's evolution, baby. You know, evolution Everybody doesn't just care. Has their asshole face. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't. Evolution doesn't care about being nice. It's about being a dick so you can rise to the top and overcome everybody else. And, and that's Dota. Dota is an evolutionary game, Austin. You have to continually evolve, continually press your advantage, overcome the competition and rise to the top. The cream of the crop rises to the top, Austin. And that's what we're talking about. Here. That's, yeah. that's what Dota's about. Is Dota about winning or is Dota about beating your opponent? Okay, then now, why that's a very were Liquid clear Gaming Gladiators and Spirit the most successful teams last year? Because from what I've seen, they're all very nice people. Yeah, from what you see, you can go watch a vlog. These vlogs are all like, oh, I respect, I respect gaming gladiators. Very, very well played match or well played match. And then behind the scenes, you know, we've been at these tournaments. You walk out, they're spitting on each other's shoes, flashing the other van's tires so they get late. You know, that 30 minute ride for Jim Q probably took so long because someone probably slashed the goddamn tires on their van because they all despise each other. You talk to any Dota player, they hate other dota players man they just pretend like they like each other it's some kumbaya family but they despise each other that's why every time a new player gets brought on a roster what do you hear what do you hear austin whenever a new player is brought on a roster i'll give you a chance um, to guess i don't know this guy's gonna lead them to i, I don't know <laughs> I, I don't know what i hear okay so After the I first thing the first thing you hear is like oh this guy is this guy is great. He's awesome. He's fitting in really well. And you know uh -huh. why they say that? Because it's prefaced with something else. It's prefaced with, I thought this guy was a piece of shit. That's what it's always prefaced with, right? There's uh -huh. always this implication of like, I never would have played with this guy. He was a dick. He was an asshole to me. Yeah, Qu called. Quinn is actually a like great him. teammate. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's like there's this perception. But the second you get him on your team, then it's like, oh, He's a great dude. I love him. We get along super well, you know? I, I go to this classic OG. They get Tomato, right? And the mm -hmm. second Tomato's on OG, you know, you, you get Seb on your pod, one of your eight podcasts. 
he's going ham he's like he fits in super well he gels nice great lad we're super stoked about him right and then like six mm -hmm. months ago you know oh whisper tomato hate each other never gonna play with each other again you know like og has no respect for tomato whatever the hell it is dota players don't like other dota players until you're on their team then they love you see and i thought you were going a slightly different re back. I thought you were going a slightly different direction with this, which was, yeah, uh, since this guy joined, uh, the team environment is great, implying that with the previous guy, the team yeah, environment too. was, was that's, terrible. That's what I'm saying. The, the second the guy leaves the team, then the implication is always like he was the issue. He was ruining the uh -huh. team environment, unless the, the exception is that the guy retires of his own will. Mm. Okay, you know, if, if you go the Matumba Manor out, got to leave out. Yeah. you know okay then it's all it's all heartstrings and we're, we wish him the best and it's my old friends you reuniting but if if you pull a kit track and you just bail or, or you pull like a you know an eternal envy and you kick some dudes it's it's all bad blood brother it's all bad blood i'll see you six years down the line i'm gonna I'm go to the gym and get swole for like five years and meet you on that land and we're gonna see what's what you know it's brutal it's a brutal world. is that what and you're that, working out right now You've got somebody you can't wait to see on land. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta fight Lellis at some point. That dude's goddamn <laughs> Jack, so I gotta catch up. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I you mean, can't we really we, talk it, people in Dota if you're scrawny as hell, you know. Well, we, 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 I mean that that doesn't stop most Dota players. In fact, the most prolific oh, yeah, shit talkers but... are frankly <laughs> pretty scrawny dudes. Yeah, but that's that's why everybody gives them shit for doing that in the first place. Like you wouldn't say that to me on land, you know, and then you go to land and they say it to uh, you. Like, well, you wouldn't say that to me in a land in my hometown, and then you go you go there, and, and then what do you do? And then you still lose. That's why people hate the winners of Dota because everybody shit talks in Dota. But if you win and you're shit talking, it's just it's like somebody somebody stop these guys, you know. And that's mm. why you can't you can't win too many lands without becoming the heel. It's inevitable. If you if you win like two or three lands in the in a row, you're you're the enemy of Dota two. I, I, I don't right. think Team Spirit is the enemy of Dota two. No, there's been some exceptions. There's been some exceptions, but like okay. that's generally a good rule of thumb. You know, there, yes, Spirit is an exception. Those guys are just too likable in terms of the the personas and personalities. They're also just way too good and fun to watch. You know, I think LGD was a similar vibe. The the prime team secret with Nisha was I think I don't think many people hated that team. You know, Liquid with Miracle, Pog Champ Bat Chest. Not many people hated that team. Though I think there were a lot of people that actually wanted to see that team lose too. Uh, it, it sounds like to me, uh, the, the team that is hated on is the exception. No, no, no. There's you're you're listing a lot of teams that are quote unquote the exception. Well, I'm also talking about other Dota players, right? Like the other teams mm. start to hate the team that's winning. Yes, of okay. course, of course. You know? Like OG TI eight, OG TI. <laughs> OG, <laughs> <Dude. yeah. laughs> wait, 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 OG TI eight, not not OG TI eight. I mean, nobody considered them winners in the first place. Was after they won TI. That's, yeah, that's why they hated. Yeah, them. Yeah. That's yeah. still one of the craziest things. I, I'm sure they you felt weren't so. supposed to win. Yeah, people were so salty about that win. <laughs> oh my Dude. god, I've never seen the yeah, Dota scene. <laughs> so salty about a ti win as ti8 og win and you're, was, you're, when I'm you say community you're talking it. about the pro players yes i'm saying the players at that yeah. ti behind the scenes because they deserve but yeah it. like if, if you guys think that the the whole fluke like god thing the, the 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 fluke moniker for og was purely a <laughs> a fan thing that people made up no there were there were a lot of people inside yeah. of dota uh, that were yeah, quite I, salty I, about og's win. Know, i was i was there five thousand years ago when when og won that ti and i can tell you like i heard from at least six or seven people at that tournament that i've never heard at another tournament since that they were gonna quit they're like done like og won they're crying they're like there is no point playing dota ever again that this team won this ti because the the feeling was that the, their perception, which was entirely incorrect, obviously. And now I think if you ask those same dudes when they look back, it's like, of course, they were a dynastic team, one of the best ever, super fun and cool to watch. You know, they wouldn't say that now. But the feeling at the time was like the previous TI winners, you had all these teams that people felt deserved to win. Or maybe not deserved, but had the the, the pedigree 
maybe for lack of a better word or like the prestige mm. of being a winning team and people didn't the pro players did not feel that about og at the time so when they won it yes. was like who are these goddamn scrubs like miracling their way into a ti victory you know and obviously now that's like mm -hmm. a completely foolish perception but goddamn have i never seen so much salt in my life as at that ti it was so salty people are just like i yeah. there's i literally there's no point in playing dota anymore I'm like what are you talking about <laughs> how does this make any sense it's like <laughs> so, much, so much salt and the, there was funny is that TI9 also had a lot of salt, uh, oh, yeah, but for the exact, it, <laughs> it, was, it was like the other side of the coin where it was no longer, oh, these guys are like, they fluked or whatever. It was, is this just what TI is? It's just yeah. going to be OG showing up and, and winning is just because they were so dominant at TI9. And as competitors, OG just looked so crazy. Uh, that it was just like, oh, it looks, you just do we even hold TI? Is OG just gonna show up and, and just keep winning? And you know, uh, maybe it's for the best for for Dota that they didn't, because apparently a lot of people would have retired. But uh, you know, I mean, then, then we had the spirit retired, run. You know, so like, yeah, exactly. I've heard fun. people <laughs> going to retire next year for like five years straight now. Well, I I did. And give me some credit there at least you know, uh, sure i mean but you're a man of principle you're a man of principle. <laughs> that's right i stick know? to my word uh but it's interesting that the different ti winners get received that way like they all have some different reception among the pro scene that i think doesn't really get seen uh sometimes it's good sometimes it's bad i think over the long run it all trends towards like oh that team was really goddamn good and people understand more of what made them win but in the moment it can be super hit or miss um, yeah sometimes overblown, sometimes underblown. And there's always some teams, there's always a team at TI that people want to win. That's the other interesting part. There's a team that all the pro players want to win because they generally feel like that's the safe team. Like if this mm -hmm. team won, nobody's gonna be too upset. You know, they're deserving. They're like good dudes. I don't feel bad about it. They're not from my region. I never played with the dudes. <laughs> Those are big factors, right? If it's some team that everybody's mm -hmm. played with and it's from your region, that's like the worst case scenario. You know, it's like, I'm gonna have to watch all my ex teammates win a TI without me. It's like that. That is, you know, I've done that for a few years now. It <laughs> feels a little bad, <laughs> but there's always a thing. Yeah, you, you you really came into casting, and then just immediately <laughs> you you watch Whatever. making when a ti. You watch. Quinn, yeah, we don't have to. We don't have to talk majors. about that. <laughs> but I'm saying, like, usually, usually it's a Chinese team because. I mean, yeah. maybe not for, for the, for the western teams. teams yeah yeah for the western teams, you know, usually there's like one Chinese team left that has a really good shot. Like usually it was LGD. And then maybe there's six or seven Western teams. Like the, the TIs that LGD was doing really well, that usually was the case. Like the top eight was usually one or two Chinese teams, including them, but they were the obvious favorite. And then six or seven Western teams. You have some upsets like, uh, you know, like these Azure Rays and uh, Aster who did well at Singapore TI, for example. But generally that there's like one Chinese team where all the Western teams are like, okay, if we can't win, I hope they win that shit. So then I, I don't have to watch one of these other dog shit Western teams win this, you know, win this TI that I couldn't. Like, they're just praying this Chinese team wins. And uh, they have not won in a while, actually. It has been since, what is it, TI six now? Wings were the last Chinese TI champion? Yeah, Actually first. Yeah. They did uh, them actually. dirty and they paid a, a pact with the devil, so to say. It's kind of insane. I mean, obviously they've had very good finishes, but they are they are searching for their victory. I mean, that that is like a, a crazy, like Wings happens, the whole ace debacle happens, Wings gets dismantled, and ever since China hasn't won a TI. Uh, yeah. Karmic justice, really. I mean, yeah, absurd. Though, to be fair, I don't know how long that Wings roster would have lasted. Um, <laughs> not that I can like, confidently speak on that obviously nobody uh -huh. knows only they really know and even they don't really know you just don't know how dota teams go most dota teams have like a two or three year life cycle in general to be honest like even if you're a really dominant team and winning almost no dota team lasts longer than that because at some point you run into a rough patch you get patched out of the meta things struggle the the leaks start to come through people get too cocky because you won they build egos like people just get sick of each other you're around people a lot and then that's just gonna create friction. So you have like a two or three year life cycle. They had like a year, so they were on the short side of that, but that team had a lot of conflict in it. Uh, they had a lot of turmoil. 
I don't know how much longer they would have been able to use that to find success. It's, it's not an easy way to do it. It is a very powerful way to do it, but not uh, necessarily an easy way in terms of long-term sustaining, whereas I think the way that a lot of Dota teams function now is a bit more sustainable. Uh, particularly a lot of these European teams, I think, have very, very stable team setups where yeah. people aren't, you know, going out behind the stands and punching each other in the face to get the draft in order. Those days are a, l a little long gone. Well, I, yeah, mostly, mostly long gone. <laughs> yeah, when was the last time you punched somebody in the face? Well, I never punched somebody in the face. That was Jack Chen's job. Legendary uh, manager, KBQ of, of G2IG. Of yeah, I made him punch people in the face. Uh, but, you know, that's what a manager's for. You got to get the manager to do the dirty work. And that's the dirty work. You got to take, sometimes you got to take somebody out mm. behind the stands and, and lay down the law. You know, we can't first. Is that why Jack has uh, been been doing so much weightlifting and getting that's right. strong? That's right. why he started training. He had because to, he, he had he's, to... he's now representing a real org, so he's got to, you yeah. know, actually okay. throw it. Well, that's a low blow, but yeah, you know, to some degree. Sometimes you got to tell your mid player he can't play Pangolier for the 30th game. Now. <laughs> and like, he, sometimes he doesn't want to listen to reason, right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to play a real hero, but somebody yeah. has to tell him no, it's enough. You can't just play Pango for your entire career. And well, apparently you can. I was wrong, but somebody has to be able to do that. And uh, that takes a firm, a firm fist. I have a, I have a question about that. Um, so we may see more of this, but we saw this move of Zai to general manager of, of Tundra. Who the hell knows what that job entails uh, specifically for Zai? But do you think that Dota teams would be any better if there was more managerial oversight over the roster and that sort of thing? If you have people who at least know Dota in those positions, you know, if you have a, you know, Zai is obviously like a pretty <laughs> high profile example of that. Uh, but like, you know, historically speaking, Dota teams are like, you know, we make all the decisions about our Dota team, right? That's kind of like where the mind control thing came from. So if you have more of these pro players retiring, more of these captains retiring, people who know the game, came from the game, understand it, do you think that Dota teams uh, and orgs would be in a better position if they had more managerial oversight in that regard? I mean, personally, I do, but I've talked to people about this. I think the way you get there in Dota is not obvious to me. I think it's one of those mm. things, like if you end up there, it on average would improve the competitive quality of teams in the scene as a whole, which is good. But the transition of how you get to that point, I don't think is very obvious and not straightforward. And I don't know how doable it is. Like, I don't really know how to do that. It's very difficult. You need very good setups to kind of kickstart that process. I think if it ever gets kickstarted properly, you'll see a lot more people follow suit. But damn, is that first one or two going to be difficult because Dota players just don't trust non Dota players. So you have to find people that a team respects that can fill that role while also filling that role well. And so it's like a catch 22, you know, you need someone who played Dota enough that people respect them and that the next team you're bringing in respects that guy, which is not easy. And that guy has to have other skills to be a general manager and see from the top down what is making that team successful from an org standpoint. And if he played Dota his whole life, that's not necessarily guaranteed. I think someone like Zai is like an interesting idea and, and could definitely fit that, but he's gonna have to figure out what that looks like. Uh, and I think Zai is a good example because he his success in Dota was recent enough that people respect him. Like you could probably bring Zai into any team currently and that current team would respect him. That's not necessarily yeah. true forever. Like if I go back and bring, I don't know, past TI winners in, right? If, if, I, if I bring, uh, I don't know. I mean, whoever I name is going to be, it's going to sound like a flame, you know, but if I go back and bring like a TI4, TI5, TI3 champion in to an org as a GM, from a theory standpoint, that should be someone players respect, but that's not true for every team. Like that's mm. a personal rapport or relationship based thing. Some teams. I, uh, okay. Respect. I've actually got a really good example. Uh, universe, right? I think very similar to Zai. Uh, First of all, had the same yeah. role, but also demeanor rise wise, right? Like nobody really hates Universe. A yeah. lot of people like him. Nobody really hates Zai. A lot of people like him, right? But the history, like he's just an older version of Zai, 
right? Yeah, in, like in are people, ways. if you bring Universe into GM your team right now, are people going to respect his Dota knowledge of the current game? No. And I think Universe would say that. Like, he, I mean, he hasn't played Dota in like five years, but like, even if he kept up, there's that doubt. Uh, so, <laughs> still need to figure out for the scene, but we have figured out how to keep slacks off the internet lines, everybody. <laughs> yes, welcome to our filler podcast. Thank you. And we have locked Flax in a bathroom, apparently, which means that we can now continue the matches. That's Thank right. Thank God. Game is unpaused, and we are ready to go. Just to recap, we are here in game two of Bet Boom versus First Team Liquid. <clears throat> Bet Boom, having won the, uh, the first game, are in a position where they are either upper bracket or will be in a tiebreaker for the uh, upper bracket. Team Liquid need to be able to win to have the same opportunity, right? Either uh, in the upper bracket or a tiebreaker for the upper bracket. If they lose, then it's up to uh, the other matches that are currently going on to determine whether or not Liquid gets into that upper bracket or if they have to play a tiebreaker or if they just end up straight up lower bracket. On, potentially, as Nightfall gets battered into oblivion. And that's a first blood for 33, that is. Not the hero you wanted to give it to. The Liquid are really happy to see that. 33 with some extra farm. If you're Liquid, you love to see it. Uh, and also extra experience for the clockwork. Every little bit helps, right? Level two and level three are so important to this hero. Uh, we'll see how effective it is, though, in this matchup where he's going to be dealing with uh, potential of Tiny Toss. Uh, so that's what that top lane looks like. Mid lane, we've got the Sniper versus Kunkka. Very different matchup than the uh, Sniper versus uh, Leshrac, which you can already see Nisha's trying to take advantage of. I, I think he, uh, I think maybe his ego was a little hurt from that uh, last game, man. Nisha has had some rough games lately. Uh, and I think this guy, you know, probably still wants to show that he is, uh, he is the S tier mid that everybody thinks of him as. Two Miss Torrents won't help him there, though. To be fair, he has had his hero very early picked in a lot of these games. Yeah. Which is giving people potential for these counter matchups. And some of these matchups are just 100 to 0, like Sniper Lesh. Like, I don't care how good Nisha is, he's, he's not outplaying that match. It's just not happening. So maybe a TI. Like a TI, you can actually outplay those matches. But at, at a random land, it's not doable. Yeah. Thing, it gets beat up here, man. Not an easy lane for the clock. This is a lane where if Tiny da D Dark Willow just play on the wave, way too much HP and really good right click early to just beat into the clock who has limited armor this early on. This is a tough lane for Liquid, honestly. Like Dark Willow Tiny is... This lane I don't think actually loses to almost anything. They just have way too good of like damage stats early. Dark Willow has one of the best BATs. She has really high base damage for her support. And then Tiny just sits here with a thousand HP regen and hits like a truck. It's like, I, I don't really know how you beat this lane. So I think Miro is going to free form up here for sure. And we'll see how much liquid can get done on the other lanes where I think their prospects are definitely better. First blood for 33 means he already has Bracer Null up. And he's just going the fight and build with the early, early Infernal Blade. Taking it to him. Looking good for him. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, level. If better. they get level three and he goes level two, uh, Scorched Earth, uh, which, you know, it's 33, so maybe he's more likely to get Devour. But if he does do that, uh, and having a Tankies in his lane, they have a ton of damage between that duo. Uh, they may try and get uh, another early kill. Yeah, I can, I can see them going for the level three kill. Definitely on the menu here. I'm going to save the skill point. He's just doing really well mid, though. Making the sniper look vulnerable yet again. Landing some torrents, burning out some regen, winning the early CS. So mid and off lane going pretty well for Liquid. And there that is, is the level Earth And blast off lands with a little extra damage from the Sticky Bomb. Uh, not enough. He wasn't actually in any real threat because they did have the healing Lotus. So Nightfall needed it. Uh, would have blown it. And he had some tangos to burn through, so... Liquid may not get another chance at that same kill. Well, another Scorched Earth in seven seconds here. That is a level two creep off the wild lane. 
Wild Wing Ripper that is quite strong here. Probably enough to dissuade the aggression. This is a very strong push lane for Bet Boom as well. If if they ever get to like level five territory and can find a kill, maybe Boxy leaves the lane, you're just gonna lose your offlane power. So this is not a lane that Liquid wanna vacate anytime soon. And you that have to think about a that lot here. Kick. They do manage to get that kill with uh, the tankies rotating across while they were also fighting out the, the top lane. They expected, I thought maybe Insania was going to die, but uh, not quite the case. They're going for a bit of a dive here on Mickey. Another avalanche, they go for the kill on Insania. Had some stick charges, Bramble does land, though. They're going to turn back with the battery salt, try and do what they can. Damage returned, but nobody in threat of dying. In fact, Mickey may not be able to man fight this one out. He throws out the Lucent Beam. Miro's going to make a run for it. Save is going to keep the damage on him, but Miro does actually die. Mickey. He's gonna try and get around. Oh, no. oh through the tree. Turn around. Lucid Beam oh gets the double kill. God. Mickey, what an outplay. That is that is a that is a brutal way to end that exchange for Bet Boom as Mickey just puts them on roast and toasts them with some mechanical outplay right there. That's a big win for him. Because that lane was, I think, the hardest for Liquid. He just gets a double kill under the tower, gets fouled up. He's all five now. Three points in the aura also means we hit this nighttime. He already has three points up. Huge amount of extra right click for these four heroes across the map. The Dark Willow coming to bottom lane. They have they just given up on trying to continue to win that lane now that the Luna is level five, making the rotation. They trade one for one, but they do get the Doom kill, uh, which is pretty important for Pet Boom. And they kick Boxy out of a uh, creep wave as well. Mid lane being dove. GPK, nothing he could do about this one. Toronto, Tokyo. He'll try and get a return kill. Nisha actually. Oh, the Bramble almost what? latched on him. If that had latched, it would have probably been the kill considering how much tower damage he was taking. I actually can't believe that I didn't hit him there. Lucky to get out alive, but Liquid making the moves, getting those early roams on. That's two kills into the sniper. This is what you want. Set the hero back, and then he just doesn't function nearly the same as we saw in that game one. It's a lot of good early presence here from Liquid, making this support duo work, getting that Luna aura up online. He got tossed under the tower, though. Nope, runs into a bramble underneath that tower. And he does have Lotus and, and Wands, so he's probably fine here, but uh, walk away a little worse for wear. See if they can get the battery assault kill turned around, though. Gets him inside. Mickey has to keep his distance, though. He wants to throw out another Lucent Beam. Uh, oh, GPK actually gets the kill on Nisha while we were watching that one. Dark Willow does manage to survive. It looks like Toronto, Tokyo uh, gave up his life to make that mid-kill happen. But worth it, though. In fact, Toronto, Tokyo can find that. That was a lane that was not going well for GPK at all. That he gets the solo XP kill really recovered his early game there and they'll split the wisdom runes so it ends up being a pretty even early game across the board all things considered both teams making some moves liquid showing a lot more life here in the early game for sure yeah which is good for their luna lineup they want to enter that mid game with a lot of momentum especially with the high levels on mickey could prove nice down the road if he can get some ancient stacks going just accelerate out of control Radiance That's where this hero is the most terrifying. Level 3 up. Battery Assault is online for Insania with this move from Nisha and Boxy. They get the X on Miro. He is surely dead. They're going to hit him with the combo here. Toss up to try and make sure he doesn't get boated, but he gets pulled back by the X into that boat and will die. So, again, more Radiance movement from Liquid, keeping a fast pace here to try and push Bet Boom over the ledge. Eight minute power rune, that's gonna be snagged by GPK, an illusion rune for him, nothing major. 3-3 is like in this base. He's just getting farmed. Yep. He just left alone a bit, but he will get Doom up pretty fast here. That first blood start, party up the phase, plus his double stat items. It's gonna be able to threaten heroes in this bottom lane. Nightfall will hold that point for the reincarn, so he, he can stay down here. He's the one hero that can stand against 33 which means 33 might be looking for the counter gank with that doom point. And these smokes are dangerous from Bet Boom. I mean, if they work, they're amazing. You get towers off the Enchantress, but if they get responded to, 
No response. Assassinate. Not quite enough to finish him, but they'll get him in the end. 33, though. He'll kill the opposing mid laner here get some revenge and we'll see if 33 can keep this going the scorched earth is going to do a lot of damage to these heroes but again when it's three he is forced to back away avalanche is going to land on him the mine is going to push these heroes back but he actually does die on the doom he splits out with some doom shards as he can throw those stuns back over the way of miro mickey comes to collect the kill and thanks to the uh helping hand of the clockwork the rocket flare will give him the vision to do so Bottom lane being pushed in heavily, though, by all that uh, space being created. Uh, you know, the, it's, it's not just the Doom who appreciates the space here in this bottom lane. The Wraith King, you give him, uh, you don't give him enough attention. He will start taking objectives. Gonna go the Armlet Radiance build, pretty standard. So if he gets to the Radiance, he's gonna be pretty strong in the fight. But this new gank where Nisha just gets caught too far away from the tower for the help to come in fast enough. I mean, 33 is ready to counter gank this move. And that's the downside of the aggressive plays from Vepboom when that Doom is is able to just counter gank it like that. This was a fight where Mikke comes in way later, but it's another factor is you're doing this during the nighttime when the Luna's really strong. Just a tough gank for Vepboom to come out super ahead on. Even though they make it work, they find the cores. And the one night ball here. Part. Wait, I'm not sure what that was. Back over to mid lane though. Nisha takes some damage, but does get a regen rune into his uh, bottle. But yeah, there was a bit of miscommunication there between Boxy and 33. 33 wanted to go on the Wraith King, I think. Uh, see if they could burn out uh, a reincarnation without a, a big spell having to be blown. Smoke back into mid lane, though. Nisha, Insania, Boxy looking for the GPK kill. And they'll find it. Event Boom do not have a save here. The best they can hope for, I think, is maybe a turnaround kill. Wait, the Terror is going to come in. Oh, that creates some space, the Lucent Beam. But they get him on the Rocket Flare now. The Eclipse goes off. It's saved, takes a bit of damage, and that is enough for them to get the kill. Though, it looks like Insania dies in that last tower shot. So, uh, some trades, but still to the favor of Team Liquid, who just bring more heroes to the mid lane than Event Boom does. How are the fighting carry? Mickey has done a lot more in this early game than the Wraith King's been able to contribute. Just nature of the hero and some small outplays on the lane set him up really well, but that's pretty good involvement from Mickey. Especially considering their lane was like not the easiest to win, so he's in a really good position. They also gave all the Ancients to Nisha, that's why that Kunkka's net worth is so high. Oh, look at this. Nightfall made this move through the portal to try and pressure this tower, but Liquid was already set up for it. Nisha! And Boxy were making the rotation with additional TPs in. They're going to outnumber Bet Boom at the start of this team fight. Will they be able to get the Wraith King out on his second life, though? Slowed down a bit by the Sticky Bomb. Liquid's not sure if they can continue to take this fight and chase or not. They will back off. And Bet Boom does the same. Does manage to get that tower denied. That's actually two towers they've denied away from the Wraith King, as Nisha did get that the offlane tower denied as well when he TP'd down there. It shows in the net worth. Look at these liquid cores. They're just playing ahead in all these fights. That's that's a great fight for them. They're not too sad that the Wraith King gets out. You put that ult on cooldown. It's gonna set him up for another kill or dissuade Nightfall from pushing farther up on the map for a decent amount of time. Another solid rotation from them. 33 showing once more. He's he can be very active on this Doombringer. Is not afraid to fight early with a hero that is generally seen as slow and greedy. At this point, I think Liquid can, like, they don't have to chill, but I think they can. Like they can just stack up Ancients, get Mickey really fat, get to their Shivas on the Doom, and they're gonna be in a really happy spot because man, the Kunkka and the, the Luna are just in great position to scale here. You already have your Blade Mail done on the Kunkka. Both those cores are level 10 already. They're decently far ahead here and they're cores that can accelerate off of that lead. So you're not too afraid to just take a lot of the map and continue farming. The last move you'd maybe want to make is, you know, for these tier ones, if you can get the tier one mid or tier one bottom, open up more space for the Luna to just excavate, you're going you're to be really happy with that. But that is also something for Liquid that can happen just based off of Bet Boom making a move. Like, let's say Bet Boom try and gank somewhere, try and make an aggressive play with the tiny blink that they just got on Miro. If Mickey is bottom, he'll naturally just get the tower off the fact that Bet Boom are going to make this gank. This is another tough gank for, for Bet Boom to land. 
this is pretty telegraphed. They're going to have to likely run into either the Kunkka or a support, which is not what they want here. And again, the whole time this move is happening, I feel like Mickey's just going to get this tower for free, and he does. So you're losing an objective to try and catch somebody in a jungle that is completely empty. That is what Liquid wanted in this time interval. Get that objective, yeah. and they didn't have to really commit for it. No. I mean, they have some heroes kind of in the area, but they're all kind of farming neutrals. Miro, he didn't get caught here on the bounty rune, but it is a tiny with the shield rune, so he is about as tanky as you could ask for, but it's still not enough. Liquid, do not run out of damage this early on in the game. This clock has, has done some work, for sure. It really has. It's not, a, yeah. it's not a bad clock meta, by the way. I think this hero's... Generally been pretty good in pubs and, and how it feels in a lot of these games, so I'm surprised we don't see him a bit more. Probably one of the only good melee fives right now. Yeah. Why well, do you think some of the others are underplayed? He is in trouble right now, though. He very boldly walked up into that high ground triangle, and now that he's been picked off, it is going to be Miro blinking in, looking. Oh, no, he doesn't get the toss back. And they turn back around with the Doom Eclipse combination that will lead to Miro burning out here eventually as the Doom will claim his life. And X Torrent on Nightfall, they are almost taking away a reincarnation from him. Uh, that would have been another big blow. Miro, he was trying to get the toss back there. And if he got it, it would have been a worthwhile trade even if he died but uh missing out on the kill on mickey that is got a smart for bed boom this tiny pick has just not worked out Miro has no. not gotten anything done off these moves the early blink not working off the smoke gank that fight doesn't get the toss back just not connecting at all for him and again downside of that last pick dark willows you ended up with this core tiny which if the core tiny snowballs the hero looks great in these stagnant games you feel pretty bad. It's a fighting hero that's not going to get these fights, and he's not going to scale as fast or as hard as everybody else in this game. He's just going to start to fall off. Liquid continuing to ramp up the pressure. Mickey has been insanely active. And missed hook shot. They uh, they got greedy. That was not a hook shot intended for Toronto Tokyo. He tried to get the plus one and, and get saved there as well. Uh, but they'll just get the one support kill. I think this is when look, Liquid looked the scariest. Like when Mickey has a good early game and can be super active on the map, and then 33 can kind of play this fight and farm style where he switches between, okay, I'm gonna make a couple early moves, but at the same time, I'm gonna get really big and I'm gonna clear up some space and you're gonna have to worry about me scaling this game. It just, it just tightens those screws and makes you feel like you don't have good options if you're Bet Boom right here. Like who do we try and shut down right now? God the whole time on the you're about this, you're just getting ganked. Yep, and they, they're just outnumbering you. They bring five heroes to this, so whoever they catch is guaranteed dead. There's going to be no rebuttal from Bed Boom because even underneath their tier two tower, they are 8,000 net worth behind. They cannot take a five on five against Liquid right now. Again, this was the strength of the Luna pick. It, it allows them to make these moves early take advantage of the pace they have against the sniper rape king who are just not ready to fight and don't do nearly as much on the five of five this pick will activate the whole lineup and we're seeing it here they're playing around it really well putting themselves in a very small position that shivas is already done yeah that is a brutal item for nightfall to try and fight through this game i mean how do they do physical damage against a very early shivas and a very early solar crest i mean you don't you have to get this radiance on the rape king and Hope it does enough in the fight. And this is a very bad position for him. This is looking like he could die twice here with the rotations coming out from Liquid to the outpost. They need to be able to land this blast off. They get it and they'll take the first life and the second life. They're going to set up for it now, though. It does look like GPK is going to try and escort Nightfall out of here. It pushes back 33 and does manage to uh, get Liquid to back off after using an Eclipse that was uh, not great. Yeah, that was not the most effective Doom Eclipse we've seen in this game. Both you and him. Absolutely nothing here. And Bet Boom gonna try and take advantage of it. Don't have that Radiance, but they know the Ultron cooldown. I mean, they want the tossbacks in this game. Just can't find them. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh no. 
<laughs> I'm not sure we saw that. Mickey mantid and he got himself up on the high ground and he didn't have a TP to get down. So Insania had to use cogs to pull him back down uh, the cliff. <laughs> Is that like the ultimate Arteezy move? You manta dodge <laughs> yourself onto a cliff? <laughs> he's he's in per he's he's been watching his idol, apparently. Yep. Studying the yep. ways of Art over here. <laughs> people people told him, Mickey, you need to be better at playing hard carrying. He just he just watched a bunch of Arteezy Arteezy clips. You need to improve your, your carry game, man. Go watch MLG Columbus run from ten years ago. Okay. <laughs> Mickey has done a lot of work this game, man. Aggressive, oh, and that aggressiveness has paid off both for Liquid and himself. 12,000 net worth right now, and 19 minutes in, he is 3,000 net worth ahead of anybody on the side of Bed Boom. GPK is doing the best there, uh, but this sniper is not the same threat he was in game number one. Big part of that. The mid lane matchup, Nisha, who's caught another one. The tanky Kunkka doesn't care nearly as much about these damage dealers, and he just boldly runs into jungle areas and finds pickoffs with X marks to spawn. Now it looks like he knows exactly where GPK is because they've been super deep ward in the corner. So they saw GPK farming that, and they saw him push forward, and they will catch him as well. 10,000 net worth lead now for Team Liquid. Well, Bet Boom do not get Mickey on the other side of the map. Who just clears out a huge amount of farm. In that area, they'll settle for a Tormentor that almost kills Drone in Tokyo. Which would be a classic for this team. They manage to dodge their own fate. And if you're Liquid, you're just thinking about Roche now. Roche and BKBs, and you can go high ground if you really want to. Again, you're building up the auras. You have the mech on the Techies. You have the Solar Crest on the Clock. The Shivas on the Doom. Torrent Storm is online for Nisha. You get a, a couple BKBs here, and that 5-on-5 five five looks very tough for Fifu. You have Radiance to go into it, but that's pretty much it. Like, you have Radiance, a Drum Charge, and your Tiny's going to late Midas here just to have some sort of scaling presence in this game, which you can't blame him for, but that means he's a Blink combo. And Blink combo at this point is nowhere good enough. Yeah. The Liquid, they have a huge 5v5 advantage right now. If they can get a Roshan in the next minute or two and use this Luna BKB to perfection, they're going to blow this game completely wide open. And it's another smoke for Bet Boom that just yields nothing here. Yeah, they no have opening. vision uh, in this triangle of some of the Liquid heroes right now, but they can't go there. And if they did, if they did try that, they'd end up running into uh, the proximity mines. And that would probably give Liquid the heads up that they wouldn't really get caught, uh, especially with the BKB on the Luna. Not an easy kill to be able to bring down the uh, Kunkka. Nisha has an amp damage in his uh, bottle right now. So with Torrent Storm, uh, uh, that's a lot of damage. That's a lot of damage if you take a five on five right now. If I'm liquid, I feel like I just go Roche here. Yeah. Agreed. It's just not contestable, and there's no reason to delay it. The sooner you get this objective done, the sooner you're going to get the second one, which you could potentially end that game with, with how fast Mickey is pulling ahead. You know you're far ahead when Luna is doing a daytime Roshan. You know? Or could. They're not going to. They're going to smoke to the other side of the map. Actually, don't like keep hunting the sniper. I think you just Roche here. Like, even if this connects, I feel like the Roche was so fast, it was just free. Even yeah. This is free, too. I mean, it, uh, like, you could look at it the same way, right? Bed Boom probably thought you were going to Roche, uh, yeah. in which case it makes this move surprising. Nightfall thought he was going to be able to just push out the, the top lane. And getting that reincarnation on cooldown is a big win. Yeah, that, that is a big one. Like, that is an objective in itself. And it, there is some sense in the theory of, like, if Roche is free, then getting other stuff is better. Because you can go do Roche at any time. Hero comes in. Stomp goes for the Enchantress. 
I thought he would go for the tiny here to try and stop that combination, but it looks like they'll get the tiny anyway with an X pullback into Torrent Storm. And Toronto Tokyo will tick down to the Doom. Yeah, they're just cleaning up kills on the map. Guess the 50 nice play by us. Dave. Oh, yeah, he, uh, just he caught the wave and then he started going right, right and then as his glimmer cape faded, he moved left. Little things adding up, but that's all you're getting right now. A couple more waves for your Dark Willow and yeah, a couple tips between the boys. But the team fight's just not looking any easier. Looks like Liquid are just going to wait for the nighttime Roche. Also not a bad idea, because if you start doing these Roshans, once it's night, then the next one's night, and the one after that's likely night. And then they're just all on your side as Dire. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's some argument there that you just didn't want to do this Roche during the day interval, and then have a later Roche potentially be harder for you for no reason. I, uh, I decided to take a quick peek here on uh, how the other matches are going. And uh, G2IG and Falcons both won their first game. So if they both win the second game, we can end up with a four-way tiebreaker for upper bracket, which would be uh, pretty spicy. So <laughs> this may no longer be the battle uh, you know, for these two teams to secure up a bracket, we may just end up in a four-way brawl for two spots. A big game for Pep Boom if they can somehow win it. Really? Yes. That would get them out of that that nasty situation. But it's looking grim. Oh. <laughs> There's some comeback potential here, but I feel like it's just off the back of Nightfall. Like, him getting a BKB and doing a huge amount of work in the fight. And that fight probably comes down to Miro finding some crazy toss back on the, the push from Liquid. Because you got to feel like they're going to push with this Aegis. Like you have BKB on Doom. You have your auras up. Have your big Torrent Storm. You're going to have a BKB on Nisha as well, I think. Yeah, that's insane. So they have three BKBs in Aegis. Level 18 on the Luna, like, you're not missing much here. GPK, he was bold enough to try and... Okay, got him on the X. Jeez, I was gonna say, where? I thought he already had him on the X, so that'll force out the BKB. It's part of the reason why GPK was up there. They don't have any way to stop that BKB TP out. Uh, so, he, uh, that is always free. Yeah, That's why he was... Oh, that's true. I was I was thinking I was thinking in my head, well, Doom doesn't stop TP anymore. I forgot they had a clockwork. Yeah. The Radiant's value of the little goblin. Is under that's true. Even though he's not a goblin. And that's also true. He's a keen. But he was originally called Clockwork Goblin. He would make it is... make sense, Austin. <laughs> uh, copyright issues. That's that's how it makes sense. Oh, okay. Valve didn't want to get sued attack. by Blizzard. Yep, damn lawyers. Ruined another hero. And true. I don't even remember what Wraith King was called at this point. Just a distant also, 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 I'm pretty sure he wasn't actually a goblin. You say Clockwork Goblin, but he was he was a machine. Not a goblin. Yeah, his name was Clockwork Goblin. Sure, in that, like, he was a small machine, but... Why would he be, why would his name be Goblin if he's not a Goblin? I, I mean, I don't know, man. <laughs> like, he's some guy just going around naming himself Steve the Dragon, and he's just a <laughs> dude? I mean, because I guess he was modeled, his, his machine body was modeled after a Goblin. He was so... a Goblin in a suit. That was the whole point of the dude. <laughs> no, he wasn't. He was. This isn't like a whatever, man. I'm done. Nice room picks up from Nisha. Steals that away from Miro, who is eyeing it. Has an arcane room as well. Liquid are cruising. 15k gold lead. Another kickoff on the Wraith King, which burns his old Nightfall. Just hasn't been able to do anything here. Nope. 
and I'm not having just, a fun time. Face. That wisdom rune's still there, by the way. Mickey, Mickey Dyer, can take double wisdom runes for his team. And that's what he's gonna find. 33's just content to doom Toronto Tokyo over and over. <laughs> dude, he's done it so many times. It's just mental damage at this point. It's like, dude, stop dooming me. But the fight is happening without him. Toss up in the air. They managed oh. to bring down Nisha and Insania. What were they doing going up into that high ground? I have to assume somebody got tossed back there. Mickey is going to turn back around, though. Nightfall doesn't have reincarnation, but he does have a glimmer cape. That almost got him, Mickey. He almost got him with the whole shard cut down, the lawn mower of the glaives. But uh, fortunately for Bet Boom, he still had the glimmer cape to get Nightfall out of there. I mean, that was just that was just a bad throw by Liquid. Like they just went high ground without the Aegis carrier in front and walked into some chains. The underestimated the single target burst damage. Like that was not a toss back. That was Nisha just walks up, gets Wraith Fire blasted into fear. And he's dead from over four seconds. So oh man, dude, this definitely. ward has done so much work for them. If he f if he manages to kill GPK here, he's got illusions on the other side. He uh, uh, maybe could have blocked him out, but the illusions did uh, tie him out. So, Mickey continues to be quite the hunter, man. He is not letting uh, Bed Boom have any space for free. Just trying to buy time for Nightfall right now. Get some sort of scale going for their cores as they are getting Nisha coming in from map. behind. Doesn't quite get the X on anybody. The Ogre Seal Totem gets him close, but he's still a bit far. Needs another 200 units, got it out the flare. And he's got the tidal wave too to push him back. So we can pull him out of that position as the, uh, oh, toss back on the clockwork. They don't even kill the Enchantress. Miro punishes them again. Too deep. Uh, this is like not even worth it. As soon as you get the engine in that position after that chase, what does it really yield you? Yeah. So bet, boom, finding some openings. As I mean, they got this Midas Tiny. He's farming. He got to a BKB. They got to triple BKB overall. So they have double four staff, triple BKB. Not the easiest to bring down anymore. If you're looking at Liquid's lineup in terms of what's actually going to commit in and bring these heroes 100 to zero. Through triple BKB, double four staff, it's the damage isn't that fast. Unless Luna can sit there and hit you. Mm hmm. So that, that's an interesting way to try and take the fight here for Bet Boom. Just out survive the initial go and put Sniper in a position where he can carry the long fight. Liquid don't get on him first. And that's the first Aegis period gone. So Liquid are really going to aim for this next one. Bet Boom just want to keep stalling this game. Ratting it out, finding a couple pickoffs. Buy time for the Wraith King to, to push the waves out. Catch up on the farm. Do you ever feel like, uh, is there going to be a timing, a set of items here where you feel like Bet Boom can take on like a real five on five again? I mean, I think they can now if they get a good initiation with the tiny. Okay. How likely that is, it just in an open map state, I think it's pretty unlikely. Like I think their best case is liquid push and they get that clutch toss back with the sniper high ground defense. Liquid are going to push now, though, with the Tiny dead. Makes it a lot more straightforward. And even that is kind of annoying because you can't use the Manta Illusions. Toronto Tokyo will always take one of those with the Enchant. And you're pushing into a Sniper, who ultimately uh, is one of the great high ground defenders of Dota 2. Insania is going to throw some rockets into the mix as he's got overclocking from his Aghanim Scepter. So uh, we'll see that constant Rocket Flare spam. When you're behind against this Aghanim Scepter, uh, it feels so oppressive because you just can't get any of the lanes in because he just Rocket Flares them down all the time and overclocking makes that even more potent. And then in team fights, you can't avoid them having vision because the Rocket Flare is so huge. Maybe this raking act could be interesting. You're talking about items that allow Bet Boom to take the five on five. I feel like that's the big five on five item. 
Like, he's gonna mm. finish up the AC here shortly, but if Nightfall can get to one more item past this AC, finish up an Ags on the Wraith King, and just keep people alive for longer, they have a lot of low cooldown spells that could be pretty impactful. If you get an extra five, six seconds because you live longer and get another round of spells off, maybe that's enough frontline and, and fight time for the Sniper and the Wraith King to clean up. Kind of see that. I think that's like the big timing here for Vecto. Nightfall just takes me into one more item. You try and fight off that. Look, we're going to try and get as much as they can right now to prepare for this next Roshan. They're just farming up some Octarines. Octarine done for 33. Nisha building his own. Honda done for Mickey. Still a huge amount of damage coming out in this 5 on 5 for Liquid. Octarine over Bloodstone? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, I thought it was Bloodstone, but he has this tiara, so... That's curious, because I, I feel like he is one of the people who is more likely to get tossed into the base. And if he BKB Torn Storms Bloodstones, I feel like there's no way he dies. Yeah, but think about it. Four second torrent. That's pretty high. Radiant I guess so. I mean, Octarine is good on this hero. He has you know, five active spells. Mickey dodges a big smoke gank that was coming his way. They had a successful scan on him in the triangle, but he backed off. His instincts lead him out of the trap that Bet Boom had set up. And he'll join his team here in the top lane where they are currently waiting for Roshan, Betboom, uh, wanting to get something off the map. We'll take the Wisdom Rune, look at Tormentor. It's not there. Maybe they take a tier two, but ultimately they're going to uh, not be contesting the big objective. This one's way too hard to contest, I think. You're never going to get a good toss back here. Yeah, just tough. I mean, again, you're playing for the high ground defense if you're Bet Boom. You don't want to throw away some garbage fights and then just leave that opening complete so you don't even get that fight when it comes. 33 on a TP here. Hoping to catch some buddies, but he's going to land in a bramble. <laughs> Save. What are you doing? What? Yeah. Axe. Oh, he gets hit by the war stomp, stopping his TP. And now they're going to come in from behind. Look at Insania. He's already spotted out with the rocket flare and save can't go anywhere. Toronto Tokyo is like, bye. <laughs> Good luck, my Good friend. Good luck, my friend. I mean, what was what was that force? Uh, we're doing a weird eat. sequence. Face the wrong direction. What can you do? Oh, saves the, the, the neutrals. What? The neutrals, they caught him. <laughs> wow. God. Doom gets used on uh, the Wraith King. He has to BKB TP out. Holy rock player. I think he's dead. Five HP. He is. Oh, he loses the reincarnation. What a snipe from Insania. Actually got him with the whole rocket flare in the fountain. Wow. 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 Hell of a throw. Man, that's a hundred second cooldown. And this is your Aegis Q period. If I'm liquid, I'm thinking about going high ground. I got my Octarine finished on the Kunkka. He's got a damp damage rune as well, which is just nuts on this hero with the cooldowns on everything. How much magic damage he's putting out. Four and a half second torrent. I feel like it's go time. Scary high ground, but this is your best chance to, to force it, I think. Yeah, they're gonna blow him up here. So a nice little pick off and some extra gold for GPK. Collects the scalp of Insania with an assassination. I mean, why not go high ground? I guess is my question. Uh, toss back too scary. Another one. 
Alright, but isn't it Gary forever? Like, what, what in your lineup changes that? No, 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 Avery. We've already talked about this. You just never go high ground, and you get a bigger and bigger net worth advantage. Uh, and then eventually something happens in the game, and you kill the enemy. And then you farm some more, and then something happens, you kill the enemy again, and eventually you kill them so many times they start running out of buybacks, and then you go high ground. That's Dota 2 nowadays. You don't win at 30 minutes, you win at 55 minutes. Minimum. Okay, but what if we just go high ground? Okay. Well, I mean, don't blame me when Liquid uh, end up throwing this fight. Why Two minutes, Aegis. Miro is going to get the toss back. Now, there's the Doom on GPK. He's going to try and get out of damage radius while Mickey is taking some damage from the uh, Toronto Tokyo Enchantress, but not enough to finish up that Aegis. Miro is still playing for his BKB, and he finally uses it now. Another toss back, this time on the Doom. The Shredder starts going to work, though. Mickey is getting some good Glade bounces around. Can he stick around to be able to finish up the full lane of Barracks without the Doom? It seems like you can. BK ticks out on the literal last tick of that Doom. It's twice now that they died on the last tick? That's insane. You're doomed, Austin. That's what I tell you every time. <laughs> it's, it's always the final tick, isn't it? Yeah, that's why it's called Doom. I don't know why I have to keep explaining this to you. Hey, you still up for a minute. Okay. Yeah. That was a push without the two supports. And they just straight up won the fight. Yeah. I mean, what, what, and thank, thankfully the sniper died. It makes this uh, high ground a whole lot easier. Like, who cares if there's a tiny toss back, right? If, uh, if there's no damage behind it, are they going to go for the full on Megas? You've got 25 seconds till the sniper is back up. They're going to try and get him here. BKB turn around, instant eclipse. Miro gets a four staff away, but he doesn't have the BKB. So the X is going to bowl him back into play. Nightfall's trying to make break, break for it because he doesn't have the reincarnation still. So he cannot man up for this fight. 10 seconds left for the sniper now as Mickey starts chopping away at that tier three tower. Tear eyes, anything to stall. They just got to stall until the sniper is back up. But once the sniper is, will they be strong enough to be able to take this team fight? Because 33 is just going to go for the same situation again. No, he blinks in and dooms out the Dark Willow instead. They'll get a buyback going in there, Mickey. Getting a little bit low here. Aegis running out as well. Boxy just wants to make sure they can't jump on uh, the carry while the Aegis is expiring. So he kind of jumps in, throws himself in there, but doesn't get punished for it. More buyback. Yes, yeah, swift blink now. Yep, just finish yeah, off the barracks. That's all they need to do. Get the X back afterwards to ensure your safety. Megas for nothing. And you were going to wait another 30 minutes. You are going to wait another 30 minutes to end this game, Austin. I mean, I, 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 I you. still feel like that's the safer play from all the Dota I've seen the last two years. Well, I think this was the correct play. I don't. I, I actually mm. don't know why they did it without the supports, but I think just going was <laughs> yeah. absolutely correct. You have a Luna timing with their second Aegis. You're super far ahead. You have too many carries where if this game just goes and goes and goes, like eventually maybe they get to a point where they can take some fight. But right now, there's just no good entry to the fight for Bet Boom outside of some crazy toss back. And like we saw, even if you toss these heroes back, they're tanky enough to survive it. And most of those fights were just 33 starting. He just goes in. He just blinked in, dooms somebody. If he can doom the sniper, great. If he just kills the support, I mean, whatever. There's no BKB control, so he can always just BKB run it all. Yeah. Dude, it's crazy no. obnoxious. This, this, like, Doom plus Clockwork Ags, where you just Doom somebody, they go back to the fountain, and they're just getting nailed by Rocket Flares, and it pushes them over the edge, where normally yeah, they would have survived the Doom, but... <laughs> really obnoxious combo. Uh, Mickey well, has level 25, of... and he's going to have Ags. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he has extra damage. I'm just saying that's that's a <laughs> that's gonna be more combo with the doom, right? If you get doomed, you can pop your BKB, but he can just wait out the doom and then eclipse you afterwards while the doom is still kind of going on. Wait out the BKB. Oh, both supports 
going in hot. Clockwork already dead, but Mickey's in a good position to put it down. Some damage, he'll kill safe and get Nightfall a little bit low. Still have a chance to kill him here from a distance, in fact. They'll take away that reincarnation. Nobody can explode. Tier 4 is going down with Mega Creeps coming in. Nish is going to take a quick trip back to base, complete his Bloodstone before they end this game. Lady of the Throne, Bent Boom, trying to get a shot off, trying to get the kill on 33. They do manage to do so, but they clump up, and that is perfect for the Luna. The Glaives rip through Bent Boom, and they're going to go to work now on the Ancient. And there's nothing that even a Fountain High Ground Sniper can do to stop this one. The damage will come in, and Bent Boom, they took the first game, but another.